This is June 15, 2018. We are in Bedford, Massachusetts at the Edith North Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital. And this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Jim Ramsey. Uh, our camera person is Maureen Sullivan. And we're privileged to have with us today uh, Jacob C. Darnell, Jr. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you very much, Jim. I'm glad to be here. Pleasure. My pleasure, too. Uh, Jacob, may I ask where, when you were born? Yes, I was born in 1939. Okay. And where? In Frankfort, Kentucky. Kentucky. <laughs> um, and what community do you currently live in? I currently live here at the VA uh, Hospital Medical Center. Uh, in Bedford, Massachusetts. Great, great. And uh, may I ask your m marital status? The, the marital status. Are you married? Oh, marital. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm married. Uh, yeah, uh, I have uh, four kids and seven grandkids. Wow, that's great. <laughs> that's great. How, if I may ask, how, how, what, what's the age range of your children? Uh, the Approximately. the oldest is uh, forty <coughs> five, I think. I think, and the youngest uh, is about thirty three. Great. I could be way wrong with that. Four kids, and so, and you have seven grandchildren yeah. kind of spread out among your four kids? Yeah, yeah. Great. And what are the ages, rough ages, of your grandchildren? Uh, they're, they range from uh, 24, that's the oldest one, and the youngest one is uh, 11, I believe. Wow. Yeah. That's great. And are your children and grandchildren relatively close by or spread out? For the most part, they are. I have one, uh, one daughter and she has three kids. They live on the South Shore, uh, in Braintree. And she's a teacher in that area. Uh, then I have my son and uh, his two kids live in Amesbury, which is where I've been living for the last 35 years or so. And um, then uh, I've got one daughter, my youngest daughter, lives in San Diego. And she comes back and forth uh, whenever she's needed, so to speak. And otherwise she comes, uh, two or three times a year just to, you know, just to be part of the family again. Great, great, great. Well, nice to have at least some of them close by. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're very good. Uh, they come every weekend since <coughs> I've been here. It's a year and a half. There hasn't been a single weekend where I haven't had a visit from at least one of them. And, uh, Wonderful. And they, they take good care of me. I bet they do. Yeah. That's great. So Massachusetts is a long way from Kentucky, yeah. uh, distance-wise and culture-wise and whatnot. T tell us a little bit about w w kind of where you lived in Kentucky and about what it was like gr growing up there and how long you lived there. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I lived there until I was 18, and that's when I joined the Marines. Uh, I uh, I had a great childhood. I uh, I we lived on a river, and I built my first boat, and fished and went up and down the river, and uh, there's uh, up on the other side of the street from where our house was. That was all trees and there was an old logging road there and nobody ever used that logging road except me 
and I, I just kind of treated it like it was my own property. <laughs> and I had a great time, uh, you know, sometimes I'd camp three or four days at a time just across the street, but it might as well have been in New Mexico or something, <laughs> you know, I was so far away from that. But uh, my, my dad was a, uh, a minister and uh, a teacher and a principal and uh, we just, we didn't have any money. Nobody else did either, actually, for the most part. And it didn't seem to matter. And uh, so I, I took advantage of, well, I love sports. And um, unfortunately, my, uh, my parents, they, Sees an opportunity to get me started in school instead of a kindergarten. It seemed to make sense to them at the time, but the problem is I'm a relatively small person to begin with, but in high school, when you're two years younger than the next youngest person, uh, you've got a lot, lot to make up for if you want to play football and basketball and stuff like that, you know. But uh, I forged ahead. I, I had a good time, and I got hurt a lot. That's all right, and uh, that's part of the deal, you know. Um, there were lots uh, by high school. There were lots of opportunities to for music, uh, drama, debating. I, I took advantage of all of them, uh, especially the music program and. Uh, I was a member of the All-State Chorus. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I recently lost a whole lot of memory, member, memorabilia? Thank you, memory, well, you okay. know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it was, you know. But, but you still remember it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I, I had a great, uh, great time. That's great. Did you have brothers and sisters? Brothers and sisters? Did yes, you have I had two sisters, one older and one younger. And, uh, great. One lives in Texas, and the other one lives in Florida, and I live wherever I am. <laughs> <laughs> so you entered the military then from your home what was your hometown, or where? what town did you live? Frankfort, Kentucky. Oh, Frank. you may yeah. have mentioned I'm sorry. Well, that's where I was born. And, and that's where you lived? Yeah, that's where I lived and went to school, high school and everything. So at age 18, is that when you that's when signed I went, up? Yeah, you're right. And that was, two, I graduated when I was 16, and uh, <clears throat> I had a full boat. Uh, scholarship uh, to Transylvania University, hmm. which uh, an old it's uh, the oldest it's it's the oldest continuing operating um, college west of the Allegheny Mountains. Hmm. That's that claim to fame. <clears throat> and uh, but I wasn't ready for college. I you know I was I was just a kid. And uh, even though it wasn't cost us anything, it was in a way because I was, if I stayed in college at the time, I was bound for failure and I know it because I just, I wasn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it seemed kind of silly to me to keep going to college. Uh, I thought I'd try working. So, um, a guy, I, I, I caught pneumonia, and I was in the hospital, and uh, the guy in the other bed in, in the room uh, worked for AT&T, and I was talking with him, and after a couple of days, he said, why don't you get a job working for AT&T? They, you know, they're a pretty good outfit. <clears throat> And so I did, I mean, I, I applied, and the man I applied to, he was the boss, and he wanted to hire me, but 
AT&T has a policy uh, in order to hire anybody less than 18, you had to send them down to the district plant superintendent to get his okay. And so they did that and uh, I went to work for AT&T. And I, it was interesting for about two or three months. And then it was not anything that appealed to me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still a 16, 17 year old kid. And uh, so I left there after a year and I went back, this time I went to Berea College. It's an interesting college in the Appalachian uh, foothills of Kentucky there. And there's, uh, there's no tuition. Everybody works in one of the college industries. There was a, this beautiful old antebellum hotel <coughs> run by the college, owned by the college, and uh, kids, uh, students worked there at the hotel. I worked at the cattle ranch. Uh, we had carpentry shops, and it's just the whole town was basically built around the college. And I had, I had pretty good success there, but I still didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. So I left college again, and I kind of set out to figure out what I wanted to do, and did a lot of traveling. That summer, I, uh, I worked for uh, California Packing Company doing the pea harvest up in Illinois. And uh, it was uh, hard work, long hours, good money. So I, you know, I, I knew then by the end of the summer, I knew that I'm not afraid of hard work. So, uh, you know, I started thinking about the military because I've always, I always had a thing when I was, as a kid, I read stories about the Marine Corps and all, all that, you know, and so I just, finally I just decided, well, let's go ahead and do it. So I signed up. And, and this was in Frankfurt? Or, yeah. Uh, 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 so you went to the recruiter and... Yeah, and uh, I actually I had talked to the recruiter several months earlier and because I, I had heard about they had three year enlistments, they did for a while, and uh, at that at that time, they had uh, stopped doing the three year enlistment, and so I said, well, I'll think about it a few months, and then one night I got a call from. I can't remember the recruiter's name, but anyway, he said, said, Jake, we've got one, the last three-year enlistment. The Marine Corps says they're going to do away with them completely after this one is gone. Do you want it? And I said, yeah. He said, okay, I'll pick you up at 5 o'clock in the morning We go up to Louisville, and they had uh, the... In I forget what it's called, the enlistment center sort of thing where they do all the all the tests and everything and I was on my merry way. <laughs> That's great. And I guess it was the Marine, it, uh, there wasn't any consideration of any other service, it was the Marines for you. No, Marines are nothing. Nothing. <laughs> did you, uh, did any did you have a, anybody in your family uh, in the military or the Marines or friends or whatever? Or just well, World War II, uh, all my, I had uh, three uncles. One's a doctor, one was a uh, <clears throat> lawyer, one was uh, an engineer, and uh, I guess that's it. And they, but my dad, unfortunately, he tried to enlist, uh, but he had um, 
now I can't remember the name of it. It was, it was Lake Yellow Fever. One of them was, because he had done a lot of traveling around the world there, and he, he got, I can't think of the name of it. Malaria? What? Malaria, thank you, thank you, malaria. So, um, but my, my uncle, who's a doctor, he was, uh, he was in a, uh, um, I think it was a destroyer, Laffey is the name of it, and it was hit by kamikazes, and uh, the ship was in pretty bad shape, and it turned out so was my uncle, but he continued to operate because he was the only doctor on board, so he he had at least temporarily lost use of his right hand. I think he was right. I'm pretty sure it was the right hand, hmm. and he just continued working I mean, you know, like a good doctor should. And uh, and then my other two uncles were. Uh, one was in the army, and I think the other one was in the, in the Navy. He might have been in the Seabees. Huh. Yeah, I think I think that's what he was. So. Uh, so you had some some family background. Yeah. From right. World War II, that was right. right. That was uh, right fresh. Yeah. Then, right. Yeah. Yeah. When you were eighteen, thirty nine, forty. Yeah. So. Great. Uh, so, where where'd you go for basic training? Paris Island. Mm. How was that? I loved every minute of it. <laughs> I I love the challenge. I love the <clears throat> nonstop. I mean, you know, we're gonna make you a marine, or or you're gonna die. So you know all these. These statements they had, the drill instructor had, that he could probably go to jail just, just on some of the stuff he said. But uh, it uh, it ins inspired me. I uh, I I loved it. It it sounded like it sounds like it was another challenge, like you'd already encountered in school and so forth, and you were ready for it. Yeah, I, I think I was. I, uh, I I just couldn't wait to get going. Was there anything about it that you didn't like, or everything was great? Uh, the things that, that I should not like, I uh, maybe maybe it's a little too strong to say I liked it, but uh, I I just viewed everything that 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 we had to do as a challenge. And I loved the challenge, and uh, I loved being successful, you know, <clears throat> that way. And uh, I guess I've always been that way. That's, that's <laughs> great. So in 1958, that was 58 when you went in? Yeah. What, what was it like in the country at that time? I mean, we were, the Korean War was well over. Yeah. Vietnam had not, not I mean, nobody not, knew about Vietnam. Right, right. So it was kind of a, kind of a quiet time, kind of a prosperous, quiet time, right, in the country? Yeah, yeah. It was, they were recovering, still recovering from World War II, and, uh, but uh, their, uh, well, Eisenhower uh, was president. If I remember correctly, and uh, yeah, it it was uh, interesting times, and uh, a lot of people really people that, that had not been successful at uh, life, so to, so to speak. A lot of them were getting a second chance. Uh, Jobs were relatively easy to get and relatively easy to keep. But you chose the Marines and the or the military and the mar Marines. Yeah, I I knew I wasn't going to be uh, a career Marine or anything else. I was I was thinking of that as a 
and the tool, like, uh, uh, I don't know, like I use the Marines to help me in, in anything I wanted to do. I, I just felt that was going to be a help if I was successful with the Marine Corps. Great. Well, it sounds like that worked out well for you. I think it did, yeah. Good, good. Did you receive any training beyond basic training? Yes, uh, I uh, received training to run a uh, message center and uh, also uh, I went to school for cryptography, to be a cryptographer. Hmm. And I found that very interesting. And um, it, it proved to be later on in, in my service in the Marine Corps, it's what I'm pretty sure that uh, I, I, I finished on top of my class and, and all the, all the uh, uh, things that they sent me to school for. And uh, that, that was like money in the bank, so to speak. Because uh, a couple of years later, I um, was working, in, I was in Capitol June at the time, and uh, I, was, I was working and uh, the sergeant I worked for said, Darnell, the colonel wants to see you. That's never a good, <laughs> never a good sign. Uh, okay, so I went, uh, you know, I said, Colonel, I understand you want to see me. Now, he was a salty old dude, you know. He, uh, he'd, he'd been in the Marine Corps for close to 30 years, and uh, he was, uh, he's kind of fun in a way. Uh, he didn't take himself too seriously. And, he, you know, you almost could joke around with him, but not not quite. You know, he could joke around with you. <laughs> but it didn't work both ways. But he said, as I got it, he said, Darnell, he says, who do you know in Washington? I said, I don't know anybody in Washington, sir. He said, well, somebody sure as hell knows you, and he flips this message. I, could, I knew it was a message because it was, came over the teletype, and I recognized the paper and everything. And it was from the headquarters of the Marine Corps, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, to me, hmm. and saying that provided I extend my enlistment by three years, I would be, I should be assigned to the Defense Communications Agency Europe in Paris, France, uh, some other stuff like that. I never heard of the Defense Communications Agency. The reason I've never heard of it because it was brand new. So as near as I could determine, uh, I, I mean, by the, by the time I got back to the barracks, everybody knew about this. Oh, you're going to Paris. Uh, I said, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I, you know, I was, I was not having a good time in the Marine Corps at that time. It was boring. And uh, then I got to thinking. I said, well, Paris. Well, I always wanted to see Paris. <laughs> Three years in Paris and everything. And the, the uh, thing that uh, convinced me was uh, one guy had some pictures. Of his brother was stationed in, in Paris in the embassy there. He was embassy guard. And there were some pictures uh, of him. And one of the pictures had Alfa Romeo sports car. And I said, ooh, is that his? She said, yeah. He, he, he bought that while he was in France. I said, oh, well. Well, I, I didn't buy the Alpha at that time because I, couldn't, I didn't have that much money. But I figured out 
I could buy an Austin Healy Sprite, brand new one, with my, if I were to re-enlist for six, I'd get a bonus of five, of uh, $1,000. And that just happened to be the price of a new Austin Healy Sprite hmm. in Paris. How about that? I couldn't lose. So I bought the car, and then I, um, I, you know, I, I just just had a great, great time in Paris. So this was your, let's see now, so you, you learned about this opportunity when you, uh, during your assignment to Camp Lejeune. Yeah, and yeah. And that was kind of your second, I mean, after school, after you finished your training, then you, was Camp Lejeune your first yeah. Duty station? Yeah, right. And you were there for, for uh, how long? Two years. A little, little more. And you were doing, were you doing the communications work or the yeah. message? Uh, yeah, the primarily cryptography. Cryptography. Yeah. Cryptography, would, would you explain in a, as briefly as you can, what is cryptography? Yeah, it's, it's simply coding and decoding messages. Uh, <coughs> it's uh, it's pretty complicated, but it, yet it's uh, relatively simple to 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 use. But uh, it uh, it's mechanical. There's these little machines that uh, oh. that you you set a certain way. You get get a message, uh, uh, or an encrypted message. Uh, and it tells you, gives you various settings and so forth, what it was. Um, so the machine sent on. basically can translate it for you, so to speak? Yeah, if you do, if you push the right buttons, you'll get the right answers. But you have to be smart enough to push the right buttons. Yeah, right. Which is why you got, went into that field. I mean, it's, that certainly is a specialty. Well, yeah, it, it was. And one of the things I liked about it is uh, people would leave you alone when you were working, doing that because because it might be a top secret message coming in that uh, is really important to everybody and you know you can't just mess around you got to get it done as soon as you can so uh, that was interesting so after obviously doing very well in your training and in Camp Lejeune, you were picked for this assignment in Paris. Yeah. And you elected to take advantage of it and you purchased the Alfa Romeo even before you got to Paris? The what? The, you purchased the car. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, the Austin Healey Sprite. Yeah. No, I, I purchased it after I got there. After yeah. you, okay. This, uh, is within within a month after I got there, I had figured out the logistics and everything for for buying the car. And so, and you were in Paris for uh, what? What was the unit that you were with? Would you say it, it was, was the defense, defense communications? Defense agency? communications agency Europe. They called it DACUR. And um, so was this it was a brand new. Was this a multi-service yes. group? Yeah, and that was that was what made it so interesting. It was it was based when I when I first got there. Originally, it was based at this uh, at an air force base that was had been uh, it had uh, <coughs> no no planes or anything at the time. It uh, its sole purpose had been uh, as a base for schools for all the dependent children in France, uh, dependent uh, of uh, American uh, military and uh, I suppose other stuff too. And uh, it was uh, not a very big base, but uh, you know, it served the purpose. So and you were there with, 
And you were, were you married at the time, by the way? No, no. Uh, but, uh, I uh, I met my my wife uh, shortly after I got there. She was the my boss's secretary. Hmm. <laughs> right. So uh, um, we we courted and we drove all over France and the Riviera and Monaco and in your Austin Haley. Yeah, right. Wow, that sounds and, pretty romantic. Well, yeah, it, it, it was, uh, and I had lots and lots of time off when I first got there because I was one of the first people that actually arrived there, and there. Ultimately, there were going to be, uh, I would say, close, 20, probably 25 Navy people, hmm. at least at least 30 Army people, probably about 30 Air Force people, and four Marines. Hmm. <laughs> and you were all doing, I mean, were you all doing the same kinds of things? Essentially, yeah. What what the idea was, where there were four branches of the service spread all over the world, and each one had its own way of of communicating. And uh, there's there are lots of different systems available to uh, use to use your as as your primary communication uh, channel. And uh, it was very expensive, and somebody finally figured out, well, if, if we have a, uh, one agency made up of all the branches of the service, they'll determine how to best use the communication channels that are available. It was... Uh, it was, a, it was a great idea. It, it was kind of rough at first. I bet it was. But uh, it uh, smoothed out. One of the things that was interesting, uh, after, after about uh, a year, we moved into Paris proper. Uh, pro uh, we moved into Paris actually in the city mm -hmm. at Camp de Loge. It's an army base. And they had, um, they had hired IBM to make them what at the time was probably the biggest computer in the world. It was a single level building At least, at least uh, 300 feet long and probably 200 feet wide, and that was all for one computer, all in that space. Wow, we had 23 full-time IBM engineers to keep the the uh, computer working. And uh, they told me that uh, this computer was not quite as, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Powerful? Yeah, not, not as powerful as a, as a laptop that we have these days. And it just, just blows my mind when I think about that. We've come a long way. Absolutely, yeah. Technology-wise, so Absolutely. so you, so were you there for a couple of years in three, Paris? Three, three years. Wow. Three what, years. What, what would you, since you were there at the very start, and you knew what the objective of this agency was at the end, would you say that it was a success? Oh, that, absolutely. It, it, it yeah. worked. It worked out. Yeah, yeah, it did. 
And uh, by the by the time I left, uh, it, was, it was like old hat. I mean, it's it's because this was the most successful military effort at changing anything that I've I've ever seen or ever heard of. Usually, you you think that you have half a dozen attempts and uh, finally somebody says, oh, forget it. And somebody else says, no, no, we'll do that. And uh, That's great. But, but yeah, it was, it was successful, I think. As far as you know, does something like that exist today? I mean, did oh, yeah. some coordinated uh, approach? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, defense communication, well, is the, there still is a defense communications agency? Yeah, Okay. right, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, it solved a lot of problems. The, uh, one of the things that they're able to do is anywhere in the world, uh, that if we have a circuit out for whatever reason, they can immediately transfer everything that's on that circuit now to another one. Uh, it doesn't even have to be in the same same region or anything. It just kind of oh. boggles the mind. You think about all that, uh, the ideas that... Uh, so it makes for a very secure communication system because yeah. if one part goes down, sabotage or whatever, right? And another can pick it up. Yeah, and that's... Uh, hmm. That's what it was supposed to do, and it was working fine. So, I know from separate conversations with you that you love cars. Yes. And I think at some point you did buy an Alfa Romeo over there, didn't you? Yes, that was, uh, uh, jump ahead a little bit. Uh, after, after my three years of up in Paris, I was transferred back to the States. This time I went, went to the uh, Fleet Marine Force Atlantic headquarters in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, I'd been there a couple of years and one day I got uh, another message. Not the same colonel or anything like that, but uh, I, you know, that saying that I should be uh, uh, I forget how, how they boarded it, but basically it was I, I should be transferred to Camp Pendleton where I would join the rest of the people in that are make up uh, uh, Marine Air Control Squadron 4 and uh, in preparation for transfer to Vietnam. Essentially, it was one of the few outfits that actually went over there as a group. Normally, since after World War II, most, uh, most transfers were individual. Right. And um, <clears throat> this, because it was a, it was a, uh, a new system for controlling aircraft, and we were, we were stationed on Mucky Mountain, which overlooked Da Nang Harbor on one side, and on the other side was, uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of the. With the South China Sea, you're talking about the water, or yeah, yeah, the the uh, it was a beach, the China, oh, China Beach, China Beach, yeah, right, that was a real real place there. If I can just stop you for a minute, sure. I think I I I force you a little ahead. Uh, I thought you had told, did you do some race car driving or yes. something in Europe? Absolutely. Or, or was that back in the states? No, well, that was in in Europe. In, in the States, in order to go racing, you have to spend at least double the price of the, uh, the car with all the safety equipment that's required 
didn't have any of that in France. And uh, so, did you was, do your sprite? Was was that what you raced? Yeah, yeah. That's. Uh, there were sports car clubs all over, all over France. It was small, you know, and it was. I, I just I just loved it. And, and so I you got, just joined one of these clubs and yeah, did some you didn't even have to to join, but but uh, you just show up uh, when they're having an, an event, and there were there were French people there, and there were civilians, there were military. It didn't matter much. The main thing is we were having fun. <laughs> that's 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 great. Oh yeah. Sounds like your time in France was pretty special. Oh absolutely. Uh, absolutely, it was. It was worth it. I, uh, I never thought I would re-enlist for six years, but I think it was for a good reason. <laughs> well, I'm sure it sounds like it did a lot of good. Oh, I think so. Yeah. So after France, you, before the Vietnam, you spent some time. You were yeah. saying, I think, in Norfolk. In Norfolk, Virginia. Right. How How long were you there? Uh, about, I think it was about a year and a half, uh, and then I, uh, got the message, uh, I was going to Vietnam, and was so, it, and was, Dene and was Norfolk at more communications type work? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was the headqu headquarters for the commander of the entire uh, Atlantic, well, the Atlantic area. fleet, hmm. or the Atlantic fleet, yeah, or, or well, not not the or no, the marine, uh, yeah, the the marine uh, uh, organizations with, uh, and so when I got got notice that I was going to Vietnam, I stopped on the way home and. Bought an Alpha, a four-door sedan, beautiful little Alfa Romeo, and I, I'm thinking back on it. Now I had previously bought an, a Volvo there, and uh, the Alpha was only two hundred dollars more than the, the uh, Volvo, the five forty-fours. I. If I had if I had known how inexpensive they were, I would have probably bought the Alpha and raced that. But uh, in Europe, yeah. But so uh, when I I got home, I I parked the Alpha right within right in front of the kitchen, so to speak, and uh, I knew my wife was in there, so I walked in. I said, hi, honey, I'm home. I've got some good news and some bad news. She said, I see the bad news. I said, uh-oh. But she came around because uh, she realized she was going to get to drive it while... Right. While so I'm, this was in, Nor in Norfolk? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, uh, we had... Uh, uh, our son was, I guess he was about... Four, and our oldest daughter was maybe three months uh, when we drove cross country to Camp Pendleton. To, to Camp Pendleton. Yeah. Okay. We, so you basically set up shop at her home in Camp Pendleton area, and then yeah. you took off for Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. How long were you in Camp Pendleton before you? Oh, it was a good, good six months. Oh, yeah. And uh, but uh, I was I was amazed that that they didn't keep me. Convenience of government. They didn't that's, keep. Oh, for the convenience of the government. That that's what it's called. If if uh, if they decide that. They need you to continue doing what you're doing instead right. of going home. And I, I expected they would put that on me, but uh, 
Well, you were in Pendleton for six months before you went to Vietnam? Yeah. Okay, and then, so your service in Vietnam, was, would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. It was, uh, they had, uh, I don't remember the name of the company that had developed this air control system. They tried to sell it to the Air Force. The Air Force said it would never work. They tried to sell it to the Army, and the Army said, no, forget it, it's too complicated. They tried the Navy, and the Navy said, no, thanks. And the Marine Corps said, I'll take two. <laughs> <laughs> so, so our job was to make it, make it work, and uh, we did. But uh, my job was to get, keep the communications going. And so what is an air control system? Well, it basically, uh, when you've got a busy airport and planes coming and going all over the place. It's like an air traffic controller? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. in civilian terms? Or? Yeah, okay. right. And uh, so that's the thing about being uh, in communications that I was. You can wind up with one one time you would wind up being a, a grunt, just you know, uh, just a, a marine uh, carrying a rifle and everything. Uh, or in the next time you could be, in, you know, in the office of uh, the commanding general. Or this, you know, you could go anywhere because everybody needed message centers and everybody yes. needed. Uh, uh, cryptographer so it uh, it was it was it was kind of kind of nice to feel like like you're actually doing something that is making things better for somebody vital yeah right so you said you you were state did did you say monkey mountain yes and that's close to Da Nang yeah it overlooked uh, Da Nang Harbor uh, the thing was, you couldn't see very much of Da Nang because there was always clouds below us. This was the tallest mountain around, and the CBs had come in and just leveled the top of it. And um, it was interesting. And the reason it's called Monkey Mountain is there are monkeys all over the mountain. And uh, they're about the size of an orang orangutan. Big. Uh, and they, for the most part, they uh, they weren't, weren't afraid of people or anything, but uh, they didn't get too close to us. But they liked to throw things. And we jokingly talked about maybe we should send them to the Red Sox, get a couple of them as relief pitchers because <laughs> the Red Sox at that time weren't doing very well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we didn't. <laughs> so were you on this mountain because it provided good communication, I mean you had communications towers up there or something like that or what? Yeah, there was a uh, big, uh, the very sensitive uh, instruments were inside like this big balloon. Uh, I didn't totally understand about the uh, air control system. Communications I knew, air control Got I didn't. It. Got it. But it, um, it was interesting to watch. So did you base, and how long were you in uh, in Vietnam do, doing this work? I was in six months. And, and basically, w were you at this place all the time, or did you go out to other, you no, know, into was, the field, I was, or? I was there all the time from 12 midnight to 12 noon, seven days a week. I see. And it was interesting. Um, there were 
the majority of the of the troops, this, we were a relatively small outfit. I, I don't remember how many people, but uh, we had an awful lot of young kids, and they they were good kids. I mean, you know, I I enjoyed having them. They worked hard, and they, you know, they they were doing the best they could, but. They were getting very, very restless because the colonel wouldn't let anybody go. Now, you've got this uh, playground below his beautiful, beautiful beach, China <laughs> Beach, and especially beautiful from, from our vantage point because it's white sand and everything, and you could see all the way to the bottom, and, and, mm. and it was just gorgeous. And uh, it uh, it was just it was it was enticing to the to the younger kids especially a beach like that oh and everything God. like that, and they could see it every day. You know, why can't we be there? And did you ever get li li liberty or uh, you know some? No, some no such thing. Uh, R and R. R &R. I guess eventually they got R and R, but uh, nobody had gone on R and R while I was there because it's only six months. Usually, it's after a year they they usually give you uh, three days of R and R or something like that. But uh, you know, it was. Uh, but I I was concerned about about the kids. Uh, you know, I, 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 I so I, I went and requested a chance to talk to the colonel, and uh, I said, Carol, I got a deal for you. I said, you, you must be aware by now that the troops are not happy. They. Uh, they feel like that uh, we need we need to loosen up a little bit and let them go down a few at a time down to China Beach there, and there was you know all sorts of activities and there, you know uh, that's a, that's a place where people from other parts of Vietnam would come for R and R, right? And uh, but we couldn't have it there. I said, Colonel, I uh, there's a there's a boxing tournament going on. The Armed Forces Radio uh, was promoting this uh, uh, boxing tournament, and I didn't know how to box. And I always loved to fight, but not in boxing because there's so many rules in boxing I could never remember them. <laughs> but uh, I said, "Here's the deal, Colonel." I said. I've got, I've got a man that works for me who was a Golden Gloves champion boxer in West Virginia. Hmm. And his name is Billy, Billy Bob, and I can't remember his last name. But he was a great guy, young guy. He kept getting promoted and then busted because when he would drink, he would just do silly, silly things that attracted way too much attention. And, and so he must have been promoted to sergeant and busted down to corporal a half dozen times at the time I knew him. But I had set up a deal with him. I said, I want you to teach me how to box. I want to set up a, a boxing ring, the uh, best we can do here, you know. And well, I don't know anything about boxing, I said. But I want to learn because I'm entering the boxing tournament. Down there. He said, Mr. Sergeant, he said, I don't know if that's a good idea. And I said, I know it's not a good idea, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so anyway, we uh, did that and it, it was, I was in pretty good shape by the time they had it. And so the deal with the colonel is 
he'd send a truckload of troops down for the to see the boxing tournament. And in the meantime, when uh, when they found out that that I was training uh, for the boxing tournament, some of the some of the other the the kids, they wanted to do the same thing. So I told Billy, go you know, help them set it up just like you did mine, and uh, and we can put a few of them in here, a few of them there, and so there were about twelve new people that went to the tournament and myself and 12 more went down and we <laughs> we were we uh we had 12 victories and one defeat wow the marines cleaned up yeah i guess Guess who the one defeat was? Not you. Uh, I was way too old. I was by then. I was thirty something years old. An old man. Uh, yeah, in in boxing terms, <laughs> and I, you know, I was just a little bit slower than I needed to be. And uh, the guy I was fighting, he had arms, the most ridiculously long arms anyone I've ever seen. And so I'd throw a punch, and before my punch would get there, he'd throw his punch, and it'd be all over my face. <laughs> but it was all in fun, and so I, I thought, well, it served the purpose. I thought, well, a few months later, they started talking another follow-up tournament or something. And I said, boy, I'm glad I'm not doing that this time. But uh, later that same day, once again, I got a, got a message from the boss, from the colonel. And I, uh, what are, I, I walked to his office and said, what can I do for you, colonel? He says, well, are you ready? I said, am I ready for what, sir? He said, well, for the boxing tournament. I said, oh, no, wait a minute, Colonel. I didn't say anything about, about two of them. He said, yeah, oh, well, I know, but uh, here's the deal. Either you do that or I'll find some very interesting jobs for you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I fared a little better this time, and uh, I did did win, but uh, but you found a great outlet for the other, the younger men to get off the yeah. mountain and do something fun. Yeah, yeah, that, that I mean, you know, I I didn't expect to be much of a boxer. Uh, you know, that's that's a skill you you learn over a long period of time, but. Um, I was glad of the results. It was fun. So when you were doing the, uh, the the mission of this group, the air control, was this like traffic at the Da Nang, like the airport, or were you doing, were, or was this for advanced, you know, operations supporting troops in the field, or all kinds of aircraft? Yeah, this this was primarily for. There were a lot of. Uh, fighter uh, aircraft, uh, I don't remember what the designation was, but the, it was the military uh, you know, strikes going going to uh, North Vietnam. Yes. You know, so. Right. It, uh, I, I, you know, we didn't, we weren't even invited if you check out the uh, the air control thing, because I think I think everybody knew that you're not going to understand it unless you spend some time with it, and you got better things to do. Right. 
so. you were involved on the communication side. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, supporting what, like the whole marine communication system in the in the area? Or? Yeah, yeah. Essentially, that's that's what it was. It, I, I never uh, really, I, I really never understood exactly what was different from the old uh, systems before, but. Uh, seemed to work. So you were there for six months. Yeah. And was that your final uh, duty yes. station uh, yeah. in the Marines? Yeah. So kind of what happened after you, I mean, did, did you leave on your own or as part of a group going back home? On my own. And I got on a civilian aircraft. Uh, it was all all pe people who were going back to the States for whatever reason. And we stopped uh, and spent a couple of days at, uh, in um, I can't think of the name of them. And then, and then they transferred us to 29 Palms, that's out in the desert. Uh, oh, right. Uh, marine, uh, marine aircraft squadrons, and uh, you know it took some getting used to being a civilian. I didn't, uh, I didn't go straight home. I, I just, uh, even though I, I, just because of the nature of of what we were doing. We weren't really very, very much involved with uh, um, the enemy. Uh, there, there were a few occasionally satchel charges where people would sneak in and blow up this and that and whatever, and uh, we'd send uh, patrols out to, and get rid of the trip wires and stuff like that, you know. Um, but it, uh, the philosophy, I, I think, of, uh, of combat, it, uh, w whether you actually pull the trigger and wipe somebody out, or whether you're just an accessory after the fact or before the fact. It, it doesn't matter what, what it is, it has much the same effect on you. Mm. If, if you're, you know, you, basically you're, you're in a combat zone, you, it doesn't matter what your job is, it's all the same. I mean, you're not going to go out hunting the enemy. There are specialists that, that have to do that because you're worth more to the Marine Corps, for instance, as, say, a, um, a message center chief or a cryptographer. I mean, for all the hours of training and the difficulty of replacing you if, uh, if you get wiped out uh, on patrol or something. So uh, that, it makes, it, it's, it's a, not a good feeling when you know that some of the people you're with are, are going to actually be in combat, and that the chances that I was going to be in, in combat in this outfit for the six months I was there are reasonably slim. Right. And, uh, you know, so that's, uh, you know, that's been a little bothersome to think of myself as. Uh, 
someone who likes to do his part and do his share and not that I want to go shooting up the, the neighborhood or anything like that, but uh, you know, there's a certain amount of, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for. Uh, I, I suppose pride. If if you uh, you know it, it bothers you a little bit if you're a marine or whether you're a soldier, sailor, whatever like that. You're in a war, but you're not allowed to fight the war, so to speak. Um, Even though you're doing a vital vitally yeah. I mean you're helping those yeah right tremendously yeah uh, who are on the front line yeah. so to speak yeah and that uh, you know I, I guess all of us Marines are really big kids you know cause that's <laughs> <laughs> that that's a, a very uh, very juvenile uh, feeling to have, I, th I think, but it's, I think it's real. But a lot of things, when you're, whether you're in a combat situation and you're shooting them up, or whether you're just doing like I did, just doing your job and hoping nobody sneaks up and, you know, shoot you, whatever. But um, you you learn to get get over those those feelings and uh, get realistic. Well, the fact is, you jumped into the Marines with both feet yeah. uh, when you were eighteen years old, and you signed up for whatever the Marines had in store for you, right? Yeah. That's and as it turned out, you had a tremendous aptitude for communications. I mean, you're a smart guy. <laughs> the Marines recognized that, and uh, that pretty much charted your course, right? Yeah. And yeah. you did, I mean, it was invaluable what you did. So, I, uh, oh. but I understand, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, it's well, so. Uh, so you were a, I think you you were a staff sergeant, were you, yes. when you, uh, at the time of your discharge? Yeah. If, uh, actually I was on the, on the list for a gunnery sergeant. Gunnery. The, the way, that, that always, staff sergeant and above, it, the promotion list comes from the C, uh, commandant's office. And... Once you're on that list, it's just a matter of time. They allow so many new ones each month, you know, until that right. uh, list is completed. So you, uh, you said you, st I think you said that you stayed on the West Coast for a while when yeah. you, as opposed to say going back to Norfolk or wait, no, no, no you, back you were, you had a home in Pendleton. Camp Pendleton, or your well, wife? Yeah, I, I, we just rented, and uh, and so once, once I sent the family back before I went to Vietnam. Sent them back to? To Massachusetts. Oh, to Ma oh okay. Yeah, and uh, then we were out of that. Uh, yeah. Is that where your wife was from? Yeah. Oh, okay. From that's, Reading. That's yeah. how you, okay. Right. So... So you came back at an interesting time, 67. Yeah. Um, things were getting pretty political, controversial. I don't have That's to tell it. you that. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I was kind of in the same, about the same yeah. time. Yeah. Um, how'd that strike you or how, how did that, I mean, did any of that, did you feel any direct effect of any of that? Well, I, yeah, I did. and. Uh, I, uh, but I, I, I jumped right in and without insulting anybody or anything, I, uh, I worked with the demonstrators 
at Salem State hmm. to uh, uh, have some positive effect and uh, I, I got I got uh, I don't know what it, there was possibilities that all these people could be having a, a, a a positive effect on how everything works at Salem State, for instance, if if we were different from uh, Harvard or Columbia or whomever, if, if we tried to understand uh, the whole idea of uh, not, how, how am I going to say this? Not just jumping on the bandwagon because somebody's making a lot of noise. If we look at it and see, well, what can we do to make it less likely to happen again? Of course, we didn't because <laughs> it did happen again. Right. You know, we've had so. But I don't know. It uh, it was it was interesting times, like you said. But it sounds like you were, you got active in. Oh, God. Um, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I look, I can't figure out how I graduated because I didn't have any time to do anything except everybody wanted me on a committee or something. I was, uh, I was a student representative on the uh, Board of Trustees of State Colleges. Hmm. For two years. The last two years, I was a member of the Bourse Commission of the, uh, let me see, the, it was uh, on a, a commission uh, to kind of dictate what the possibilities were for the future of the state colleges at, at universities. And we met over a period of two years all over the, all over the map. Uh, California. All over the country? Yeah. <coughs> we met at Denver, we met uh, San Francisco. Uh, initially, we, um, that first meeting was at uh, outside Washington, D.C. I don't even remember the name of the place now, but it's a little, it's a relatively small conference center. Uh, and we had, we were there for three or four days. And that's, that's when I, I really got to know former Senator Wayne Morris. He was the one of two votes against the Gulf of Tompkins resolution to, to do the Vietnam War. And uh, he is such, such an interesting person. And uh, I admired him since I was a kid. There was, there was mm. something about his presentation that, that Caught, uh, caught my attention when I was real young, and and I don't even remember what it was, but uh, but I got to know him real well because he and I were the only two people in this on the commission that were early risers. So we'd get up and have an hour or so walk <laughs> every morning, and uh, we. He'd, he was a great conversationalist, and he he told me that there's two or three things he told me about uh, about demonstrating against the war and things like that. And uh, one of them, uh, he talked about one of the big demonstrations in Washington. He marched there, and he said as we were walking along, and I looked over and. There's a rear admiral, Navy admiral, walking beside me. And said, that's 
geez, that's strange. This guy's in his full uniform and everything too. So anyway, he mentioned that to the to the gentleman, and the, the, the admiral says, "Yes, my my, uh, my superiors know that I'm here, and uh, essentially they've uh, made it clear to me that uh, I will not get another promotion." He said, "But I really don't don't care. Uh, there's uh, too many things that don't." make sense in this whole Gulf of Tomkin thing. And the interesting thing to me is that last year, I think it's USU's News and World Report, what one of those, had essentially that same story verbatim of what he just told me about about uh, this um, uh, the idea that that somebody else started the the war, and basically what the story is that uh, the uh, the whole thing about the uh, um, the, in the Gulf, Gulf, uh, the the story is that that the small boats attacked uh, a boat, uh, a U.S. boat, and uh, anyway, this admiral was at the time he was senior. Uh, how do they say a senior officer on on board, and he wasn't the captain of the ship, but he outranked the captain in certain situations where, you know, he would he would be privy to um, a certain amount of information that normally would, would have stayed right there with the uh, captain, and. Uh, I was just flabbergasted that it, it was almost as if he was telling the story again to me, mm. and uh, it, it made me realize that there's, you got to start watching, paying a lot more attention to how things get started because they get out of hand pretty quickly. Once they get started, yeah. Right. Hard to stop them sometimes. Right. Wow, that's good for you for all of your. I mean, you're obviously a thinking person who. Uh, yeah, um, I try. Isn't afraid to share his thoughts. Thanks. <laughs> did you uh, after you got out of the Marines? Did you kind of stay in the reserve or or? Uh, or, or were you part of any like you know organizations or veterans groups or whatever? Or did you well, pretty much I wasn't until I guess it was about ten years after I got out. Uh, a guy lived down the street from me at the condominiums on uh, Lake Gardner in, in Amesbury. The guy was in the National Guard. Um, out of, uh, I don't really remember which, which city, which town it was out of, near Boston. Yeah. <clears throat> and he talked me into giving that a shot. So I did, and uh, I almost immediately knew that I didn't have any business doing this. Giving it another, sh giving the reserves, or, or giving what another shot? The uh, joining the National Guard. Oh, okay. Yeah, because there was no military discipline. Uh, you know, the military, as you well know, that you know, there are certain formations. You go, you got. 25 people you want to move from here across the street, 
you can let them wander and smoke a cigarette while they go out and everything. Yeah. Or you can just tear it up and uh, it gets their attention and, and Ryan Fierce, oh word, <laughs> and uh, next thing you know, they're there. But that wasn't happening there until I finally had, had just about enough. So I just walked in and I said, I need uh, to talk to someone who, who can uh, tell me how I go about resigning. Oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. I said, want to bet? And I said, uh, look, I said, I've got two, two um, discharge papers, honorable discharges. They're real ones, not the toy ones you guys have. I was insulting them to write that because I, I you know, the, these were, these were the, the officers supposedly in charge and they sitting there drinking coffee and uh, and finally, I I just we we had something to do with health related. I don't know what it was, but I just kind of took control, and I I just said, "All right, line them up, boys." And uh, so the the the, the troops. They understood understood why I was so frustrated. So I had gotten my old rank back. So I was a staff sergeant, and the uh, I don't know the the troops seemed to feel like that was that was helpful to them. But I I said I I just can't can't do this anymore. He said. Uh, if you want to write me up a uh, discharge paper, you've got my address. But if you don't want to, don't worry about it, because I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> so how important to you was serving in the military? Oh, very, very important. I, and I don't think, I'm not saying I think it would be important for everybody, but it, it I feel like I uh, had to do it because I had I had pretty much made up my mind a year or two before I actually went in that uh, I wanted to do that. And uh, you know I didn't know a whole lot about uh, Army and Marine Corps. I mean. You know, it, it it was a little bit of a mystery to me, and that's part of the intrigue. Uh, I I like I like things that uh, I don't know what the I'm trying to trying to think of what the appeal was. Well, I don't know. It it, it just. Life is not dull in the Marine Corps. It sounds like you and the Marines were a really good fit. I think so. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm certain of it. So, was there a most memorable experience from your military career, or something that somehow sticks out, or memorable character? Yeah, I. Uh, well, the memorable character would would be. Uh, Billy Bob, whatever his name was, he was the boxer. Yeah, I mean, he he was a hard worker, but he's a drunk, and uh, and he would tell you that. He said, uh, Sergeant Darnell. He said, you know, you know, I'm a drunk. I said, I know, Bill. I said, but that doesn't mean that we can't work together. I mean, I'm I'm not going to give you a hard time about it because there are plenty of them. Plenty of people be willing to do that. And I said, uh, I I told him, I said, I I admire what you've been able to do despite your problem with alcohol. 
And, uh, I don't think that uh, we need to bust you, take your rank away every time you do that. I'd rather just work with you and not do that anymore. And, uh, you know, we, we tried to work it out, and uh, he, he was making some progress. Sounds like you may have helped him out. Well, I hope so. So, if you, as you look at your career, and as, as you know, there'll be a, a DVD of this interview that mm. will be available for you and your yeah. family. Um, is there one thought or incident or anything that you kind of like to share with your family or others uh, who will see this tape? Doesn't have to be, but I just thought I'd ask the question. Well, uh, hmm. Well, one one of the things that that uh, I I like to, like to tell people about is my first the first night in Vietnam. Um, we had to you know we we got there as a unit and this ship pulled in and we got off and headed up the mountain and everything and, uh, and we had to rather quickly set up uh, the perimeter uh, guards and posts and things like this and we'd, we'd heard stories about the monkeys on Monkey Mountain how, uh, how much fun they were to watch but you had to be careful Know, they like to throw rocks. I said, oh, okay, that's cool. cool. So at any rate, I was uh, designated a sergeant of the guard for that particular night. And, uh, you know, we just had various outposts and uh, people established here and there. And, you know, I would have liked it better if we'd had we hadn't, we weren't a very big outfit, but I would like to have had a few more troops who, who should guide some perimeter. Uh, Security. Guard. Yeah, right. But uh, we didn't have, so I just did the best we could. At any rate, it was about 3 a.m. and I hear the squawking on the uh, the box, Sergeant Darnell, Sergeant Darnell, we're under attack. Said, what do you mean you're under attack? Yeah, yeah, Johnson here, he's he's bleeding. I said, I'll be right there. And I said, well, unless they've developed a new gun that, that is silent, there's something other going on. <coughs> so we get there and I shine the light in there and sure enough, Johnson was on the floor, nose is bleeding and he's got a big cut right here. And I looked around, sure enough, there's a rock over here about the size of a baseball. It's got blood on it. And I said, Johnson, when did you get hit with this projectile? And he said, what do you mean, Sergeant Darnell? I said, what were you doing? Oh, I was looking out the parapet of the bunker. You know, it's, it's leveled in such a way that it, it's, it's kind of hard to shoot through that because it's the way it's layered, made of sandbags and things like this. But uh, he said, yeah, I was looking out the window of the parapet there and the bang, it hit me right in the face. And I said, well, the good news is uh, it won't happen again. So
so uh, don't worry about it. And then I, I just, I just cracked up. I, I was thinking, oh my God, we we had the whole mountain just just kind of stirring because one one monkey threw a rock <laughs> happened to hit somebody. <laughs> and it's about, I don't know. So I don't guess he got a purple heart for that. No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> that's that's quite a story of the monkeys. So is there anything we haven't asked you or any additional comments that you'd like to make? This has been a great interview and we sure appreciate all that you've shared. But anything else? Thank you. I think we pretty well covered uh, most everything that, uh, that seemed to be relevant to me. I uh, really appreciate you having me. This, uh, this has been fun. Well, we appreciate it too, and I know your family will enjoy this, and uh, also researchers and others. You've, you've got a great story, and you've told it well. So I want to thank you, uh, Jacob Thanks, Dornell, Dan. for uh, participating in this Good interview, man. and uh, best of luck to you. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome.